This is Phil Howlin, and I'm taking the opportunity to talk you through the UNSW Tyree Trigen System Hydraulic Schematic, just to give you an introduction that you'll need for your assignment. So if you're having some trouble working out what we're looking at here, uh, this video should help you. So first of all, I just want to give you an overview of what we're looking at. And so what we've got here is a number of uh, hydraulic circuits that are taking heat from the engine, waste heat from an internal combustion engine, and using it to either chill the building down or heat the building up. So we'll just talk through each of these circuits in turn. Right here. So out of the engine, we've got the jacket water heater, and that's this circuit here. Okay? Actually, I'll draw it so that it's got the whole loop in there. Okay? And the flow is going clockwise, right? driven by a pump there. So the flow is going clockwise. And it's taking heat from the engine. And you can see here it's taking 433 kilowatts of heat from the engine. And it's either delivering it through the jacket water heat exchanger to our next hydraulic loop through heat exchanger HE1, or it's delivering it through the emergency cooling heat exchanger through HE2 down to another hydraulic loop that we'll talk about in a moment. Let's go to the next one. Actually, before we move on, I just want to point out these valves, CV1A and CV1B. Okay, so these are three-way ball valves. And this allows the circuit to either just go directly between the engine and HE01, okay? That's one potential way that the loop can go. If CV1A is allowing the water to pass straight through here, and CV1B is allowing the water to pass straight through, or if I remove that, our water can come into the engine, go around, it can bypass heat exchanger 01, and then go through heat exchanger 02. And this is in the configuration with emergency cooling. Okay, so valves CV1A and CV1B exist to direct the, the uh, thermal energy from the engine either into the jacket water heat exchanger or into the dump or the emergency cooling heat exchanger. Right, so under normal operating conditions, we'll be taking our energy from our engine into HEO1, coming back, back to the engine. And that is our first circuit. Now let's come across to our second circuit and see what's going on here. <clears throat> so now we're taking thermal energy from HE01, and we're coming across, we've got our pump here. So this pump is giving us flow of our water. And again, we've got two options. One is we can come up here into our absorption chiller. There it is, absorption chiller. Come back down, bypass HE04, and go back into HE01. Okay, so this is taking the thermal energy from the engine and using it to run the absorption chiller. Remember that the thermal energy we got from the engine was 433 kilowatts, okay? And by the time we get to the absorption chiller, it's absorbing 411.5 kilowatts. Okay, so we've got some thermal loss or maybe some inefficiencies in our heat exchanger or some thermal loss out of our pipes as we're going along. And the absorption chiller is using that thermal energy to chill some chilled water. So to take water that's 14 degrees and chill it down to seven degrees in another circuit, or if we remove that, if it's a cold day and we don't want chilling, we want heating, then it'll flow through here, it'll go up, it'll go through CV2A and be redirected there, and come across here and go through HE04, heat exchanger 04, and <clears throat> come across to the air handling units. Okay, so this second circuit 
that I've got in purple is either taking that thermal energy up to our absorption chiller or is taking that thermal energy across to the air handling units. Now let's talk about this, um, the hydraulic circuit that's um, the flow is created by pump 7. So this takes the thermal energy from HE04, comes across, flows provided by the pump, and it takes it into the air handling units. Okay, and then flow returns. And so in this hydraulic circuit, what you'll find is this is liquid water um, moving through this circuit, and the air handling units will have uh, a series of fans <clears throat> that blow air. So they'll take air from the building and they'll blow it over these hot pipes, these pipes of hot water, and that will heat the air up and then they'll redirect that hot air back into the building. So that'll provide heating for our university buildings when it is cold weather. All right. So when it's cold weather, you want to use the air handling units. And when it's hot weather, you want to use, do I have another color? I can use yellow. We want to use our chilled water. So we bring in cold water through the absorption chiller. The water gets colder. And then we push it back out to our building. <clears throat> and then again, this chilled water is used to chill down uh, other parts of the building. Now, there are a few other circuits that are worth being aware of. So we'll come and see them. Let's get ourselves another color. There we go, orange for the intercooler. <clears throat> so we can see here an intercooler circuit, an intercooler heat exchanger. All right, so let's start at the heat exchanger. So we're going there. Now we're going this way. By the looks of things, yep, good. This is water coming in at 40 degrees, coming into the intercooler and then back out, flow is being provided by this pump and it's coming along and you can see we can bypass this circuit as well if we need to. And so the intercooler is because we have a turbocharged engine, so when you turbocharge the air, the air will get hotter and so we use the intercooler to remove thermal energy from the air, reduce its temperature, increase its density and so that it combusts more efficiently and gives us more power for the same engine size. So that intercooler circuit is also happening. And we can see here HE03, the intercooler, then passes this hot water to the cooling tower where that thermal energy is dealt with. So that's 60 kilowatts of thermal energy that we're getting from our uh, turbocharger intercooler is then dealt with in the cooling tower, adiabatic cooling tower. What else goes to the cooling tower? Well, we can get a kind of another orange. Right? If we are not putting the thermal energy into the jacket water heat exchanger, say for example, the chiller and the air handling units are both offline, well, we need to get rid of the thermal energy somehow, otherwise we can't run the engine. So we run it through <coughs> our emergency cooling heat exchanger, okay, and that comes down, and our hot water comes down into our cooling tower, and back up into our emergency cooling heat exchanger. Okay, so potentially, we'd be taking this 433 kilowatts, <coughs> excuse me, of thermal energy, and also putting that into the cooling tower. Now, when you get into the details of how an absorption chiller works, you'll also note that for an absorption chiller, you need a few things. One is you need a hot source of thermal energy, which is coming in on the purple line. You also need the thing that you're chilling, so a chilled source, and both of these put energy into the absorption chiller. Okay, you can see here that our hot source comes in at 90 degrees and leaves at 78 degrees at a cooler temperature. So that, in effect, is a cue into the absorption chiller. And we can see in our other circuit, the liquid is coming in at 14 degrees and leaving at 7 degrees. 
Okay, so it's leaving colder than it came. So that is a Q in to the absorption chiller. Now, either this absorption chiller is disobeying the first law of thermodynamics, or it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, or it needs to find some way of rejecting all of that thermal energy. And you can see here that indeed it's got 411.5 kilowatts coming in, down there at the hot Q in, and it's got 300 kilowatts coming in here at the cold Q in, and so it must have 711.5 kilowatts. This must be Q out to the environment, and you can see this is coming in. This flow meter here is telling us that it's 86 meters cubed per hour. It's coming in, it's absorbing thermal energy, so it's coming in at 29.5 degrees C and leaving at 37 degrees C, 36.7 degrees C, so it's becoming hotter, so it's taking energy with it. And this is going out and out and out and out and out. Flow is being provided by this pump here. <clears throat> and where is this hot water going? Down, 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 oh, into the cooling tower. And then it comes back at that 29.5 degrees C, back, 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 and it's ready to be put back into the absorption chiller. So this is 711.5, okay, plus <coughs> uh, the 60 from the uh, intercooler. All right. So 710 plus 60 is about 770. So this cooling tower needs to have a capacity of more than 770 kilowatts. And so it does. All right. Now, in the occasion where you're using emergency cooling, right, you're not going to get any heat come through this green from the absorption chiller because the absorption chiller is going to be offline, um, but you are going to get uh, energy come through this heat exchanger dump, potentially 433 kilowatts. So the uh, cooling tower needs to be um, able to handle that kind of rejected, rejected heat. So that's the big picture overview of all of the different fluid circuits. All of these circuits are dealing with water, essentially. Right? You can see here that there's a dosing pot associated with each of the uh, pumps. And so this is going to allow us to put uh, some sort of probably corrosion inhibitor and maybe Legionella inhibitor. Um, so some sort of chemical inhibitor to stop uh, bacterial growth and also corrosive, uh, the corrosive nature of the water. Um, and so we, you can treat this in your thermodynamic analysis as being uh, a sub, like a, a slightly compressed liquid. So you can use the saturated liquid values of your steam tables for all of the water here. Okay, and we've got temperatures throughout. So um, this one says 40 degrees C, coming in at 40 degrees C and leaving at 46 degrees maximum. This one says uh, coming into the jacket water heater at 84 degrees C and leaving at 92 degrees C. Okay, and so you've got a flow rate and you've got some temperatures and so that lets you um, Oh, there you go, 92 degrees C, max. So that lets you know um, what's happening thermally throughout the system. If you want some more details about what's happening in this engine section, so how this 433 kilowatts is being added, you can see here you've got temperature gauge 1207 and temperature gauge 1206. Well, there's also a document in the information that's given to you. Let's just load that up. Okay, and here they are. All right, temperature instrumentation 207, temperature instrumentation 206. So this shows the coolant coming in to the engine, going through a temperature gauge, going through the engine, um, all the parts are listed here, <clears throat> going through the engine. Uh, there's a pressure relief. Um, so if the pressure goes above three bar, it'll um, uh, vent some of that to drain. Um, the pump is at seven, so you can see here, and there's an exhaust stream, so it's getting heated again by the exhaust stream before going to heat exchanger. So that information is there. Uh, what other information have I set aside here? Oh yes, cool. So this shows the air intake coming into the engine, going through an air filter, and then being mixed with the fuel gas 
So five is fuel gas, four is a mixing chamber. All right, coming in, here's our turbocharger, number seven, and then it comes down to our intercooler, number nine, so this is where 60 kilowatts of energy are being removed from the airstream, and then it's coming into our combustion chamber, and then the exhaust stream is running a turbine, and the turbine is, has it through shaft through the compressor, and that's a pretty standard um, turbocharger arrangement. It's my intention to also make a video about some of these components, some of the more complicated components, and so that uh, you'll have a bit of guidance in the analysis of them as well. I hope this was helpful for you, and uh, all the best with your assignment.